Okay, looks like we are going to be recording the webinar. Right, whenever yeah. you're ready, Mr. Graham. All set? Yes. Okay, then I'd like to call the regular meeting of Empire Town Council for November 8, 20, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. to order. Roll call, please. Councillor McGee. Councillor Toner. Here. Councillor Burnett. Councillor Grinstead. Here. Councillor Strike. Here. County Councillor Lynch. Here. And Mayor Stack. Here. And we'll just acknowledge that Councillor Burnett will probably be in later. He's got technical problems uh, getting into the meeting. So I'd like to uh, have the land acknowledgement now, please. So I'd like to begin I'm by acknowledging sorry, did you try which we work and gathers the traditional unceded territory of the Anishwa Bay people. This Algonquin nation have lived in this land for thousands of years, long before the arrival of the European settlers, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. May I adopt the agenda, please? Be it resolved that the agenda for the regular meeting of council dated Monday, October 25th, 2021 be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. <clears throat> Lynn, Lisa, any comments? All in favor? Carry. Thank you. Do we have any disclosure of pecuniary interests? Seeing none. Thank you. Any questions on previous business? I do not have any hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. We have the minutes for October 25th, please. That the minutes of the regular meeting of council listed under item 7A on the agenda be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Chris and Dan, any comments? All in favor? Carried, thank you. We have no awards or delegations. We have a public meeting on uh, zoning bylaw for Marshalls Bay. The council move into a public meeting regarding a proposed zoning bylaw amendment 521 for phases three and four of the Marshalls Bay Meadows subdivision. Okay, uh, mover and seconder, please. Tad and Lynn. Robin, I guess you're up. Yeah, I have a presentation Kayla's going to bring up for us. Okay. Apologize, my computer is taking its time. <laughs> Yeah. You see it now? No, just as you start sharing. Oh, there we there go. Okay. So, as Mayor uh, Stack indicated, the uh, public meeting tonight is with respect to zoning bylaw amendment number five of 21, and it has to do with lands within the Marshalls Bay Meadow subdivision, uh, more particularly phases three and four there. Um, as this is the statutory public meeting required under the Planning Act, uh, just some general information. Uh, when you're addressing the chair, if you could give your name and address for the recording secretary and note that if you wish to be notified of any further proceedings con concerning this application, if you could provide your name and address to the clerk of the municipality. Be advised that the Ontario Land Tribunal, Tribunal may dismiss an appeal of the application if the appellant has not provided counsel with an oral submission at this meeting or a written submission before the amendment is adopted. If you'd like to speak, please use the raise hand feature and Kayla will bring you into the meeting. I'll give an overview of the application first. Uh, this key plan of the subject property, um, as council is well aware and, and um, most of the public uh, are familiar now with the name Marshalls Bay Meadows, but these lands front on to Madawaska Boulevard, right at the border of Empire and the city of Ottawa, um, just north of Madawaska Boulevard and back onto the um, former rail line uh, along the back of the property. The property that's shown in red here is the entirety of the uh, Marshalls Bay Meadow subdivision and phases one and two are uh, registered already and uh, well underway and tonight's application will deal with phases three and four 
of uh, five total uh, phases proposed there. Oh, uh, the current designations of the land uh, include for, from the official plan, uh, low and medium uh, residential area designation. Our official plan uh, uses this designation when we're looking at residential areas that were recently developed or are on the, uh, on the edges of built up areas, so green fields basically. And they are planned for a variety of, form, uh, variety of housing forms. The zoning bylaw right now for these lands designates them something called what we call future development or FD. Uh, and that sort of is a placeholder for future um, residential or, or commercial or whatever the, the underlying official plan uh, designation is uh, to be applied to the lands once a plan comes forward. So they do require an amendment uh, to support any new development and the zone only permits currently uses that are legally existing on the date of the passing of the bylaw. So it's okay to use them um, as they are today, but any uh, development of the lands requires a rezoning to recognize the new use. So the proposal for these lands um, as shown on this plan in red, uh, this is the draft plan of subdivision and the lands in red are the phase three and four lands. So uh, to, the, to the west or left of the red, um, the areas shown in black that are designated a variety of zones are three and our four. Our fours are the phases one and two. And then the phase five lands are shown in the dark shaded gray to the east um, or right side of the subject lands. Within the uh, proposal, there are a variety of designations proposed. Uh, I'll just point them out quickly here and then go through what they are um, on the next slide. But the R3 is along the railway at the back of the property. Um, the open space is in the back corner of the property where the pump station will be located. Uh, there are exception R3s along street number six running uh, north south. And there are R4s with exceptions um, on street two and uh, to the south of the property backing onto uh, Madawaska Boulevard itself. Thanks, Kayla. So for each of the designations that are proposed, um, there are specific uses that are permitted and in some cases, some exceptions to our standard zoning. The R3, as I indicated along the rear of the property, along the uh, uh, rail line, uh, would allow just for single detached dwellings or semi-detached. In this case, they'll be singles with no exceptions to the R3 uh, zone provisions. The R3 exception zone that's shown uh, on um, running north-south on the interior uh, street is a zoning to allow for semi-detached semi residential uses. And the exception um, is to the requirement of section 643G of our bylaw, which requires that individual driveways accessing uh, the two semi-detached units be paired. In this case, they're uh, requesting that we be able to uh, split the laneways uh, to the outsides of the, of the dwellings. The R4 exception number 28 uh, recognizes some townhouse development along the back of the property as well. And the exception in that case would be a minimum interior side yard of 1.2 meters as opposed to our standard 1.8. The exception uh, R to the R429, which would be at the um, front of the property or the Madawaska Boulevard area, would allow zoning for either back-to-back -back street townhomes or apartment dwellings with a maximum building height of 15.45 meters, um, as opposed to the 10.5 meters that's permitted uh, in the bylaw currently. That generally recognizes as a four-story unit. And as I mentioned, the open space or OS zoning at the back corner of the property would allow for the location of the stormwater management pond. Um, the October 12th council agenda provided an overview of the application under item 11A that really uh, lays out those a little more, more, more concisely. Uh, to date, there have been no uh, comments received from members of the public with respect to this application. And in conclusion, we reviewed the intent, as I said, of the zoning bylaw in a staff report that was provided to council on October 12th. Uh, council will receive any comments this evening prior to consideration of adoption of any amendment to the zoning bylaw. And a report will be before council with the recommendations and amending bylaw, if applicable, at a future meeting. I think that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them, Mayor Any comments or questions from anyone? I just have one comment, Robin. I know you won't have seen it yet. I just saw an email and I forwarded it off to you. I don't know if it pertains to this specifically tonight, but it is a division and you can follow up on I do have one hand raised, Mr. Mayor Adam Thompson. Okay. Okay, Adam, you should be able to unmute your mic. 
I believe I'm unmuted now. Thanks. Uh, no, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> perhaps add to to Robin's comments about the uh, the unpaired driveways. Um, the the purpose for that is is particularly to do with grading. Um, those uh, those two streets um, uh, that are, that essentially run north south um, have are, have a steeper grade uh, than others. And so by separating the, the driveways, uh, there can be a, essentially a grade, a grade raise difference between the two units, uh, between the semi-detached units. Uh, so they'll have different floor elevations despite having uh, a joint wall. And uh, so uh, long and short of it is that's, that's, the main that's the primary reason why we're asking for that, uh, that amendment in that location. If there are any other questions, certainly I'm I'm here as well. I believe um, representatives from regional may be on the on the uh, call as well. Okay, well, nothing further then. No more, Kayla. Thank you. Okay. I do not see any other hands, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. So we have to return to uh, regular session. Yes, that council resume to the regular meeting of council. Mover and a seconder, please. Dan Lynn. All in favor? Carried, thank you. So no matters tabled and staff reports. Uh, first one is uh, the private road OP policy. The council initi initiated townwide official plan amendment being OPA number four and implementing zoning bylaw amendment to establish common element condominium private road policies and provisions. And further that pursuant to sections 1715 and 3412 of the Planning Act, Council hold a public meeting on Monday, December 13th, 2021, regarding the proposed amendments to allow for public review and comment. Mover and seconder, please. Chris and Lynn. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, Mayor Stack. Um, I did provide Council with a brief uh, introductory report, but I'm going to introduce uh, our consultant guest this evening as well. Um, just to start off, I, the reason that um, this is coming before council is that staff have received uh, several requests from developers with respect to the to the premise of um, medium and high density residential developments on private roads in Armprior. But our current official plan doesn't really speak to uh, to this option, um, and we have dealt with them uh, in the past as a separate separate um, individual application for amendment to our official plan to recognize them as a permitted use, but um, that development never ended up going ahead. So we, we literally haven't, uh, haven't had to deal with them, very frankly, but we are getting a lot of questions. And therefore I uh, contacted one of our standing offer firms, uh, JP2G Engineering Council is very familiar with that firm. Uh, you may not be familiar with uh, Forbes Simon, who is their senior planner, who has, um, extensive experience in municipal planning, uh, being, being a neighbor planner in Mississippi Mills for many years, uh, and now being in the consulting world, uh, Forbes has um, reviewed uh, our official plan policies, some um, legislation around private roads, some best practices, and has provided a report to council to address some of the issues surrounding the idea of private roads. So, I've invited Forbes to uh, to come to council tonight to present his findings and make some recommendations to you. So I'll turn it over to Forbes now. Okay, welcome Forbes. Thank you very much, Mayor. Do, do you hear me then? Mm -hmm. You're thank a little you. weak. Yeah. I'm very good, I'll speak up. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, this was an interesting assignment uh, working with Robin. Um, one of the first things that I did was reviewed your official plan to get a sense of what was the important themes within Armprior as a community. I, I want to start by saying your official plan is an excellent document, um, though there is this one little area that I think needs to be improved. Your official plan paints a very, very clear picture of what is important to the community. Um, having new development that's consistent with the character of existing developments, making sure that you have a transportation system that's balanced with new emphasis on uh, pedestrian travel is very important. And there's also a clear direction on the expectation of what is to happen within a road allowance. Um, 
It forms the function of sidewalks and active transportation. It has important roles to play in snow storage and on-street parking and signage. And it really is a fundamental component of the design of any neighborhood is the streetscape. The Renfrew County official plan provided some direction. It spoke of the traditional private cottage road that we all know about, um, but it also speaks to uh, new private roads being in the form of condominiums or common element condominiums. And the, the Renfrew County official plan defers to the local municipalities to come up with um, appropriate policy. I also reviewed the provincial policy statement. Um, and although it's silent on planning, uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs for a number of years now has been promoting um, new private roads um, as being common element condominiums and to move away from the traditional sort of cottage road right of way approach. It's felt that the condominium uh, approach has much more robust um, tools and mechanisms to deal with disputes, um, long-term financial capital replacement costs, and really is, is the tool that's designed to manage this type of, of development. When you're looking at private roads, again, uh, the report talks about these common elements as being the only type of, of private road that you should be considering in the future. Um, and that the road allowance needs to accommodate, a private road allowance needs to accommodate the same things that a public road allowance needs to. Um, your infrastructure, your curbs and your gutters, street parking, street lighting, um, signage, boulevards, and perhaps the most important thing is access for emergency vehicles. And so in the end of the, the, the day, the right of way of uh, private roads needs to be large enough to accommodate all these street elements, yet narrow enough for the buildings to form um, the, and frame the street. And over you know, my tenure as a planner, which is, is over 35 years now, most municipalities have sort of settled on 20 meters being the standard road right away with that's necessary to accommodate all these elements, particularly in an urban environment where uh, active transportation is being emphasized. So it is submitted that a private road and a public road have the exact same form and function. It's just the ownership is different. We also conducted uh, an industry scan um, looking at issues that happen around narrow road allowances. Um, I've spent some time in the report of talking about medium density residential development, particularly townhouse development, that by their very nature result in more congested streets than what you would see in a, a single detached neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and there are examples in communities where uh, townhouse developments have, have created parking problems in neighboring, um, in, in neighboring streets uh, simply because they can't accommodate all the cars within their, their neighborhood. Uh, it's suggested that that problem only gets worse when you go to a reduced uh, 20 meters or a standard reduced from 20 meters. In terms of um, neighborhood characteristics, I, I submit to you that the 20 meter street road allowance is a defining element of most communities and their neighborhoods. And if you start introducing uh, smaller um, uh, road allowances, that they're not going to have the same look and feel or be as compatible with surrounding neighborhoods as what a 20 meter road allowance will achieve. I, on section six of the report council, I have identified um, six different municipalities that I scanned. Two were rural 
in nature. Two were similar to uh, Armprior's characteristics. And then I've had two larger uh, metropolitan areas, all of which generally have landed between 18 and 20 meters um, in terms of right-of-way widths, with 20 meters being the, the common. I have provided a number of recommendations in the report uh, that are for you. Uh, the first being recognizing that the form and the function of the private road and a public road are the same, um, and that the only types of private roads that should be considered are through the condominium process. Um, and that um, the right of way is a defining element of uh, existing uh, neighborhoods and community care character, and that 20 meters is a fundamental building block of those characteristics. And then I've gone on to give you specific wording that I think would improve your official plan um, and, and provide the policy framework for private roads that you don't have right now. I also did um, uh, take a look at your zoning bylaw and there's one suggested change in wording that, that I would recommend for your zoning bylaw as well. And then as an appendices, I have provided um, suggestions for you to consider in terms of your private road standards going forward. Um, that's the conclusion of my report. I am happy to, to answer any questions that, that council may have. Okay, thanks, Forbes. Any comments or questions from council? Dan? Thank you, Mr. Forbes. Is, uh, on your street, are you allowing for one or two sidewalks on either side or none? Uh, Councillor Lynch, thank you very much. That's a, a, a great question. I think that if there's an expectation that there's going to be two sidewalks, you absolutely need the 20 meters. When you drop down to sidewalks on one side, that's when you can start looking at an 18 meter right of way. And I've provided some flexibility uh, for that option, but I think the preference is 20 meters and 20 meters is what's needed to have um, on-street parking uh, plus sidewalks and to maintain the six meter emergency vehicle access. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. I just have one comment or clarification, I guess. You said it would only be for uh, condominium type use. I just want to clarify that a bit because I know like Robin made the reference earlier uh, one site in town here, when there was an earlier plan for it, it was to include private roads and it was going to be apartment type settings. Are we, are you saying that in a way of being that restrictive that it's only condominium because of uh, the uh, responsibility for maintenance and things like that? Uh, Mayor, thank you very much for that question and, and, and the opportunity to clarify. Um, the developments that would be supported by the private road can be freehold, single, detached. Mm -hmm. They could be um, apartments. They could be townhouses. It could be any form of residential development. Um, and what I'm recommending is that the road itself be a common element condominium and that it be associated to tied lands, but those tied lands could be any density of residential and they can be created through the plan of subdivision process. And they don't have to be created through the condominium process, but the road itself needs to be a common element condominium component. Uh, hopefully that Thank clarified you. Yeah, things, Mayor. That's perfect. Thank you. Ted, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Barb's, uh, the roads going into these developments uh, probably would end in a dead end. Uh, did you give consideration to a turning radius? Thank you very much, Councillor Strike. Yes, the um, standard that is in the uh, Appendix A does have a 12 meter minimum turning radius that increases uh, in size. Um, yes. Thank you. 
Okay, anyone else? All in favor then, please? Carried, thank you. And the next report is on the marine operations, Kim. Council directs staff to bring forward an amendment to the recreation facility use policy to implement a 60% resident use of marina slips. And then during the 2022 budget process that the annual update to the user fees and charges by law include an increase in the marina rental rates for non-residents by 40%. Okay, move and second, please. Lynn and, and Graves in for this one? Yes, he should be in momentarily. There he is. Good evening. Um, am, I, am I good to proceed? Um, so as Kayla uh, outlined in the recommendation, uh, we're looking to have uh, council to direct staff to amend our recreation facility use policy to implement 60% uh, residential use of our marina slips, as well as increasing the cost of non-resident use by 40%. Um, kind of what's driving uh, this, uh, this recommendation of this report uh, is that this year uh, we did have the marina uh, sell out. Uh, first time we've uh, encountered, uh, I say problem, but only to those who were unable to, to get a slip in our marina. Um, that being said, there were a number of residents that were unable to either get off the waiting list or when they did inquire later into the summer about uh, getting a slip, uh, we were well sold out, uh, obviously, by that point. So uh, operationally, a good problem to have, but for our residents, there was certainly some disappointment there. So I quickly want to just give a bit of background before we kind of get into the discussion about this. So our, our marina does operate for a period of about um, 18 to 20 weeks. It typically runs from uh, the, the long weekend in May through to uh, the Thanksgiving weekend in October. Uh, so up until um, uh, 2021, uh, the marina operated uh, with 96 slips. And between 2017 and 2019, the town averaged uh, 67 seasonal rentals um, plus monthly and transient uh, renters uh, with the busiest uh, rental period um, being 78 slips over those uh, over that three year period. So in, in both 2018 and 2019, uh, the marina did operate at a substantial defi deficit over $24,000. So at that point in time, after the conclusion of the 2019 season, um, it kind of prompted staff to, to undertake an operational review uh, of the marina operations to see what changes could be made and where efficiencies could be found in the operations um, for the marina for the 2020 season. Uh, so what was decided going into that um, was that the, the marina would operate uh, with staff uh, down at the marina Friday, Saturdays and Sundays and any holidays through that, that period. Um, in uh, the busiest, uh, we had 73 renters throughout 2020, the busiest weekend being 85 slips, which again, at that point in time, we were still operating with 96 slow, total slips. So still 11 shy of, of full capacity. Um, but with the oper operational changes that we did have in place, um, the marina did operate at a surplus of, of $14,000. However, despite those operational gains, the marina is still not operating at uh, cost recovery when one takes into consideration the future, future uh, capital requirement uh, to replace the aging infrastructure um, uh, down at our marina. So for the 2021 season, uh, Operational hours mirrored that of, of the 2020 season, again, Friday through Saturday um, and on holidays as well. Uh, other changes were made to the marina for this particular year. Uh, we brought down that 12 foot high chain link fence um, and removed those, uh, those pier, uh, pier shacks that were in disrepair and were damaged uh, due to the floods waters of 2019. Um, and we undertook a pilot project maintaining the operations that we've always had on piers one through five, 
um, but converted Pier 6 into a public access dock to provide free docking for up to uh, eight boats for a four hour maximum that would allow boaters to come in off the water um, to explore Robert Simpson Park, uh, shop or eat in our downtown, or just explore the, uh, the trails or anywhere along our waterfront. So traditionally, the way that um, our, our marina operates is that uh, at the usually February, March of the, the following year, we reach out to the users of the previous year to inquire if they wish to uh, renew their, their seasonal slip for that upcoming season. Uh, they're given a period of time to, to make that renewal, at which time then any remaining slips become available to the public. Uh, so there was never uh, an issue in terms of capacity. Uh, so 2021 uh, operated as we typically would have. Um, a wait list began to grow um, at the, you know, at the time that slips were, were made available to the public after we had a pretty uh, good response to our renewal period. Um, and then we ended up selling out the marina for uh, the entire year. So as the summer progressed, we have a lot of residents that are, are concerned about residents not being able to have access to a marina um, that they feel they should have access to. And it's something that uh, our taxpayers are paying for as well. So what that did was we, you know, as staff, we, we looked at, you know, kind of what other marinas were doing, uh, presented a report to the uh, Community Development Advisory Committee uh, back on the 18th of October um, to consider a variety of operations um, that included uh, dedicating a set percentage of rental slips for residents uh, and implementing uh, non-residential uh, rental fees for out-of-town users. Uh, I, I wanted to note that as part of this uh, research that, that we compiled, when we looked at other municipal marinas to see how they charge, what their seasonal rate was, what their rental process was, how we uh, currently operate in that we charge by the foot, um, and that in terms of the rental process, we always have that returning uh, seasonal renters getting that, that initial priority, is pretty consistent with other marinas that we looked at, Pembroke, Deep River, uh, Whitby, Brockville, uh, and Gananoque, just to name uh, some of those that, that were reviewed. So again, it's worth noting that um, none of which uh, have a, a non-residential rate for those uh, marinas that are municipally run. So in 2021, now uh, we had 81 season renters for the Empire Municipal Marina. Uh, the breakdown was as follows. 40 of that 81 were our prior residents, that makes up 49%. 17 of the 81 were McNabb Brayside residents, which make up 21%. And the balance, which is 24, which comes out to 30% of the 81 slips, uh, were those from other municipalities, primarily from uh, the city of Ottawa, but we did have others from, from the surrounding area as well that were not included in our prior <clears throat> or McNabb Brayside. So it's also important to note that in 2021, um, we had 60 renters that did return from the 2020 season, 33 of whom were from Iron Prior, 11 from McNabb Brayside, and 16 uh, from outside those municipalities. So I should also note that as, as part of what we're discussing here this evening, uh, the marina is not, I repeat, is not included in the current joint recreation agreement that we do have with McNabb Brayside. So marina users from McNabb Brayside, um, based on this agreement, would be categorized as non-residents. So if we were to implement the 60% resident use of marina slips, this would provide a minimum of 50 slips out of the 84 for resident use. Uh, this volume of slips would be left available until four weeks before the beginning of the season. And if they remained unused, uh, they would be accessible to anybody on a first come first serve basis. Utilizing a resident versus non-resident fee um, is a common practice uh, for some municipal services. Uh, this includes recreational rentals, programming uh, and cemetery interment rights. Uh, the markup for resident versus non-resident fees is typically between 40 to 50% increase for uh, the non-resident. So just to uh, provide an idea as to what that cost increase would have for the marina, currently the 
resident rate for a seasonal rental is $32.50 a foot. For, non, uh, for non-residents, if we went with that 40% increase, that would equate to $45.50 a foot. The monthly fee would increase from $17 a foot to $23.80. And the transient rate, which is $15 a day for residents, would increase to $21 a day. When we reviewed uh, this report at the Community Development Advisory Committee, uh, they did express support for a minimum number of slips available for residents, as well as a non-resident rate. However, concerns were raised that through the process of providing a minimum number of slips, we could force out renters that have been in, uh, in the town's municipal marina for years that perhaps were not residents of the town of Armprior. So options that uh, council could consider, uh, make no changes and just maintain the status quo. Uh, approve the 60% uh, resident uh, use of slips, which would be 50 of the 81, but make no increase to the non-resident uh, user rate. Council could also approve the 40% increase for non-resident users, but not set any percentage for uh, user access in terms of resident versus non-resident. Council could also consider having Pier 6 return to a rentable pier, allowing for eight, eight additional slips for rent. I would note that this, however, would eliminate any public access uh, docking um, and prevent access to the downtown Robert Simpson Park by boaters um, and the economic benefit that could come with those visitors. And this would also come at a cost of approximately $3,500 as we would have to purchase uh, a new gate and lock system to be installed on Pier 6. <clears throat> at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions that council may have. Lynn is up there first. So Graham, I just wanna clarify, say that no other marina has a non-residential non-residential rate correct of any of the the municipal marinas that i researched um and i was looking for any that might have uh you know that resident versus non-resident rate in place uh, i couldn't find any municipally run marina that would have that okay in in that though do any of them uh sell out like are any of them in the position where they sell out uh, none, none that were, none that were reported or anything again that I could find that would suggest that they're that they're reaching uh, capacity. And okay. many, I should also note that some of the larger ones, I mean, Armprior, Pembroke, Deep River, typically not reaching uh, cello capacity. When you look at those, and some of the larger municipalities, you know, even looking at Whitby, Brockville, Gananoque, um, and some bigger ones in southern Ontario, um, you know, you're looking at marinas that have. 150, 175, 200 plus slips. So um, typically that is not an issue for them. Okay, so for me, I just, uh, again, as, as we did with CDAC, I want to express that I'm in total favor of this because Armprior maybe never had this issue before, but Armprior is also fast growing every year. We're getting bigger and bigger. And these residents pay uh dear taxes like they they do pay uh some of them have hefty tax bills like I, I know i'm not the only one that hear residents say that their taxes are higher than they were in the city when they lived in the city so i feel that we have to change um the way we do things in order to meet our our new residents and and the residents that we have that have, have currently um maybe just taken up voting or whatnot i i think um, the people that are paying taxes to our uh, town should have a, a slight priority or, uh, you know, advantage uh, to be able to take part in a municipally run um, service. So I'm all for that. And I am all for keeping the eight public access slips, even though they're not used fully yet as we move forward um, and people know that they're there, I think every year you'll see a bigger and bigger return on that. So um, I think the town, we want to market the town as a tourist destination. So I think that that is one way that we can do that. That's my two cents. Hey, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm going to go against Lynn. 
I'm going for number two, approve the 60% uh, resident uh, users, but make no increase to the non-resident. I uh, compare it to the airport. We have people from all over who ha have tie downs or, or park at the airport. We don't differentiate between if you're from Armpur or Perth, you're still paying the same amount of money for your airplane being tied down. With the non-residents, and we included McNabb Brayside, when these guys uh, tie down, obviously they come to town, they may get the gas. The local resident will probably go home for lunch or bring it with them, I'm not sure. But they're local, so their expenses, they're not gonna spend money in town where the other people will. I think that would make up the shortfall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, anyone else? Lisa? Um, I, I read this over 10 ways from Sunday and I, I support the report the way that it is recommended. And the reason for that is, I think that marinas are one of those things that should be revenue neutral, that the tax base should not be funding any deficits. Um, it is a privilege for anybody to be out there enjoying their boat and using the marina facilities. And if that is a, I mean, I, I think it should be revenue neutral even for residents, but if that is someone who's a non-resident, non-tax contributor, I would struggle with that even more so. And I think that this strikes the balance between making sure that we are respecting our residents, still allowing for um, economic development and visitors into town and respecting those who may have had slips for a number, you know, for, for a number of years, which is one of the concerns um, I see that was raised from CDAC. So um, I, I support this. I mean, we don't know unless we try. And I think that this is a, a step in the right direction to help address some of the concerns that have been raised. I, I certainly have heard from some residents who were not able to get a slip this year um, because they, they were all taken up before they had a chance and they were reaching out, I think, rain in, in January even. And, you know, they were told that they had to wait. So um, good job. I will be supporting the report and the recommendations as they are written. Oh, I have a question, actually, if I may. Um, I'm told that once upon a time there were uh, docks over on the other side. Is, it, is that something that might be revisited at some point in time as well? Could that increase the flow, like over near the, um, the riverside, down that way or down? Hydro Park had them, yeah. Below the restaurant there. Were those public docks at one point in time? Um, maybe we've talked about that at some, because someone reached out to me and asked me about that. So historically, yes, there were docks there. I know there's some um, varying history there about how all that, oops, excuse me a moment. Um, yeah, there historically was um, docks there. I believe there was an arrangement with the, uh, with the restaurant there in terms of how they were managed. Now that was simply public access. The other concern that we do have um, is just we look at all the work that was undertaken by by OPG in that area with the with the boom system and, and the fence in that area, um, and just understanding you know perhaps some of the dangers of water uh, of the waterway with with boaters getting in and out of there. Um, certainly, that is something that I think needs to be uh, reviewed and and also something that will be um, touched on, albeit briefly, uh, when we bring the waterfront master plan uh, forward to council. Okay. Anyone else? Ted? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just a clarification. The, uh, the hotel built the docks or the restaurant built the docks uh, uh, with the approval of, of the town and they were for restaurant customers. They were maintained by the owners. Okay. Thanks, Ted. Okay. I have a couple comments. Uh, being a former McNabb Brayside resident who had a boat for a number of years in the Air Empire Marina. And, uh, you know, was only uh, at that time only home on weekends. And finally, I think it was only there two or three years because I found there were a lot more than my own two teenagers using my boat. So I decided to sell it before, uh, for my wife's peace of mind and safety reasons. But uh, I guess, and I, I had a chat with Robin about this earlier too. I have a I'm just struggling a little bit because this marina for as long as I've been on council has been a discussion. It's been, you know, always had to be subsidized because of, of lack of take up. And there are residents and I agree, you might be able to go back to records and find out. I don't know how many of they are, but the residents of McNabb Rayside who have had slips there for years, who have subsidized that marina, 
who have supported it for a lot of years. And now if we just sort of say to them, like everybody else throughout, I'm struggling with that a little bit. The numbers and the increase, I don't particularly have an issue with. I agree with uh, with Councillor Grinstead on the on the on the public access docks. That was one year. We need to with the whole future waterfront development coming. I think that needs to be promoted and hung on to, you know. Uh, but the other thing that goes through my mind is there were a lot of boats bought in the last couple of years, like there were side by sides and ATVs and other things we do to COVID and not getting out. How do we know that? whole new demand and some of it may be new residents they understand but there's an element of that percentage in there those boats may be gone in two years when things go back to normal boating's uh, uh somebody i think referred to it as uh, an expensive process and uh, the ottawa river is not as simple to boat on as you think it is so a few experiences could change people's mind about uh, boating here if they're inexperienced so the risk of some of that demand dropping off may be offset by growth, but I have, I'm just struggling a little bit by saying to people in McNabb Rayside who have been, you know, slip owners for, or renters for years, you're now, you know, a non-resident, it's gonna cost you 40% more and, you know, uh, good luck, you like everybody else, depends when you get your name on the list. So, and I don't know, Graeme, what sort of option there might be for that, but you know. If I may, I mean, uh, yes. it's not written here in the report, but, you know, we could also, we could always consider saying, look at our prior residents, um, you know, we, we go out, we make sure that we, we hold on to that 60%, which would be, which would be the, the 50 slips. Um, we did have 17 McNabb Brayside residents from this past year, and they could be captured within that, um, within that renewal, that seasonal renewal piece. Um, and then, you know, if, if, if in the end we're still staring down the, uh, the nose of another sold out marina for the year, then we, we, we basically replace that, uh, that difference from uh, the non arm prior McNabb Brayside residents, if you, if you get what I'm yeah, yeah totally So basically, the, if we that other category, if we ran with what we did right now, you know, we'd have, we had 40 of arm prior this year, 17 from McNabb Brayside. That's, that's 57. We're suggesting that we add another uh, 10 slips available for our prior residents. So that uh, that would take us to to 67 total, um, which would then again leave us um, that would leave us uh, 14 shy uh, then of a sellout. And that, those 14 remaining slips would be for those, um, you know, first come first serve. So those could be our prior residents. They could be McNabb Brayside or they could be those coming from City of Ottawa uh, or elsewhere. Yeah, and I think with your cutoff date, you know, at least if those historical renters are in that group up until the cutoff date, if they don't book by the cutoff date, then they have put themselves out there for, for risk on the list with everybody else. But I think yeah. after being, you know, renters for years, they should be in that first category, you know. Well, and, and the, the proposal would be that we would still operate with the same renewal process and that we go yeah. out to the the users from the previous year it's just the caveat being that um there's gonna we have to pull 10 10 uh slips from one at least one group or from two groups to to make our prior uh reach that fifth that that number of 50 or 60 percent if you will that's fine by me lynn so yeah that's fine too and and i'm suggesting that we pull those 10 slips from anything other than McNabb Brayside Arm Prior. Like like Mayor Stack was saying, um, it's not that it's not that I want to see putting out our neighbors, but we also need to uh, take care of our growing population. So um, if if we give the priority uh, to your renewals and then just hold off on the out, outside ones. That sounds like a plan. Ted, did I see your hand too? No. Well, it's been covered. Thanks. Ted first. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I agree with what's just been said recently. Okay, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to clarify, the 60 slips will be arm prior 
and McNabb Brayside? Or no, so, at 60? 60. So the sixty percent would remain our prior residence, which is, which totals 50, 50 slips. Okay, and then you're, and then we're going to promise McNabb Brayside X amount of slips. Well, essentially, those that are um, those that we had seventeen this past year from McNabb Brayside, we would ensure that those seventeen individuals could renew their slips if they so chose. If they opt not to, then any of those remaining slips just kind of get add to what's available to, to everybody else. And then, and the, the McNabb rate side will be paying the non-resident rate or not. Uh, that would have to be an amendment made to the report um, that has, is before us right now. Sorry, just one second. So as a report is now they would be, they would pay a non-resident. So, correct. Yeah, Lisa, you're. That's that's what I wanted to confirm as well because the recommendation is the one that I'd be supporting. So I'm sure I'm wrapping my head around exactly what it is that. I think there hasn't been an amendment to the recommendation at this point in time, correct? No, no, no. Okay. okay so, just one thing, Mr. Mayor. Walter Chris has his hand yes. up. Yeah, thanks. I acknowledged him. Yeah. Oh. Um, Graham, just when I was reading this uh, report, um, like, are we trying to make money on the marina or is it just a cost recovery? I mean, because that's a, that's a big pro. I mean, uh, whether it's supposed to make money or just kind of break even, kind of um, plays into how, you know, how I think this should all go down. Um, I mean, I if if we're trying to make money and make money for the marina and come out positive, then I think we should certainly raise the rates for non-residents and uh, you know maintain the status quo of being open only three days a week and the holidays. Um, so that's one thing. Um, certainly. To echo everybody else sentiment about the, the oh it's is it called the transient slips transient slips of course they should they should certainly uh, certainly uh, stay um, and I mean I was I was fine with you know the sixty percent uh, of the arm prior but the new plan of you know helping our neighbors. And make sure that they kind of make they maintain their slips. That's a good. That's a like a good add-on. Um, so I mean, basically, I'm I'm fine with what people are saying, but I'm not. Uh, again, I'm not too I'm not too keen on charging a non-resident rate. If I mean, if 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 our purpose is to make money, uh, well then yes. But if I mean, if it's a service. I just kind of see that there's going to be a having people dock their boats, residents and non-residents, and I understand that the residents pay taxes, but there could be a divide between the two, and I, I just I'd hate to see any problems caused there. So, so to answer your question, Councillor Toner, with respects to the marina. Um, I think the, the short answer is yes. The intention is is certainly to make money on it, and, and primarily, as outlined in the report, um, you know, even with the the surplus that was made operationally uh, last year, the the capital replacement that we're we're looking at for that marina is is quite extensive, and that's just to even get us to to where we currently are today. Um, Never mind future enhancements, growth, et cetera, to that to that space, and um, uh, you know it doesn't benefit the conversation right now. That you know the the waterfront master plan hasn't come before council yet, but that'll be at the next council meeting. Uh, but I think that's an important piece. Now, is increasing the the rate by forty percent to McNabb Brayside residents or, or any sort of just non residents, I should say you know, is that going to make a substantial bit of difference? Not necessarily. I think part of the, the motivation behind that uh, is also to perhaps support capacity for 
uh, residential use of, of the marina. And if out-of-town users are still content to, to pay that increased rate, then I think that's something that everyone would therefore seem as fair and no different than when we rent the ice here as well. We have many users that are from outside of the town of Armprior and McNabb Brayside because they're included in that joint rec agreement as part of the next Smith Center. Um, so when we do have those out-of-town users, you know, renting ice, uh, they're playing a, paying a substantial premium of, of 40%. And if it's an adult group, you know, you increase 40% on $175 an hour and, and it's not, uh, it's not so bad. And it certainly helps things along. Okay. And Lynn. I, Graham just kind of answered my question. I was going to ask the, what the increase when we rented out ice or what, what not to non-residents and Definitely, our marina should be running in a positive for uh, maintenance and, and whatnot that could happen at any time, because for all of these years, that money has been coming out of capital and the town has been supporting the marina just as it supports a lot of the recreation. So it would be great for us to actually have a little bit of cash left over every year to be put in reserves for when it needs it. Hey, the one, just one sec, Lisa, the one point I was just going to make, and surpluses need to be gathered in a capital reserve for the marina, then if that's the thing we're doing. So, you know, I have no issue with it, you know, because it's another example of where, yes, some residents pay, or, you know, all residents pay for services that only some use. We don't, you know, that's just uh, the nature of municipal functioning. Lisa? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Just wanted to, to add to Chris's question and Councillor Prince said some um, comment. This and actually what you just said as well, Mayor Stack. This is this is voting. This isn't some things that are you know necessary that or that I would consider more necessary. And so from a policy point of view, um, I'm not sure I agree that it should actually be making money, but certainly putting money into the coffers in the events that um, into reserves for any maintenance and whatnot that is required um, would be prudent. And, um, and take, you know, we, fundamentally we cannot be subsidized. I, I don't believe we should be subsidizing non-residents during times that we have a deficit, it, not, not for voting, um, you know, for, for some other things, but that, that I definitely struggle with. So um, that's- that And again, the, like I said, there've been McNabb residents who have been subsidizing this marina or renting it for years when it was barely, even, you know, 50, 60% occupied, you know, and I know because I one of my boat was one of them that was was in there at the time. Uh, okay, okay, last round, last comment, Dan, then we need to clean this up so we know where, where we're going with it. Can't hear you, Dan. My apologies on the mute. My, I was gonna ask for the, the flavor of, of to make the amendment to the motion that we include yeah. the 60% residents Plus the McNabb Brayside people at no at no non-resident, and we keep Pier Six. Okay, uh, my understanding was that we're keeping the transient, if we want to use that term, the pier, and we're going to do the. I thought it was fifty-seven plus ten. Was that right, Graham? Uh, so if we if we opt to go with the sixty percent for town residents. That would be 50 slips for our prior residents. Currently, uh, in the past year, there were 17 McNabb Brayside uh, renters. So that would bring us to 67 between the two municipalities. So we'd have the, the transient slips, the total of, of uh, 67 for, you know, the... the Local. I'm going to say the preferred or option to rent, whatever. But my understanding was that the increase, non-resident increase, would apply. I'm looking for a shake of heads on Lisa, Lynn, Ted. Yeah, sure. Ted, yeah. yeah, good. Because maybe the airport should look at that issue uh, if there's many people from out of town in there for additional revenues. You know. So are we clear on that? Uh, Maureen or Kayla, who's Kayla? Mr. Mayor, I just, I just, so I'm just confused, I guess, on the, on the non-resident rate. So I originally from the conversation had 
that you were going to be giving access to the previous year slips for McNabb Brayside residents within the seasonal renew period at a resident rate and then following that renew period that it would be a non-resident rate but are we saying that we're just giving them access to the their slip and they're paying a non-resident rate they're paying a non-resident rate is my understanding of what the consensus was okay okay Okay, Dan, this is the last one that I'm going to ask for the just, amendment to be read. Yeah. Just asking for a recorded vote, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, good. I just, I don't want to lose this now that we got it. Kind of. Okay. Did you want me to read it? No, clearly for everybody. So. Sure. So the council amend resolution 39321 to add a paragraph three that McNabb Brayside residents be given access to their previous year's slips, equaling 67 slips between the two municipalities within a seasonal renew period and that McNabb Brayside residents be paying the non-resident rate at this time. And the, and the is that pier one, Graham, the transient will stay? Pier, pier six. Pier six. And pier we'll six, stay. yes will stay as transient. Okay, is everybody okay with that? You got it? Okay, then uh, we've uh, been asked for a recorded vote on it. Councillor McGee? Yes. Councillor Toner? Yes. Councillor Grinstead? Yes. Councillor Strike? Yes. County Councillor Lynch? No. And Mayor Stack? Yes. Okay, thank you. And our next very much. National Earthquake Warning System. The council received staff report 21110803 outlining the proposed lease of space in the Stanley Toronto Fire Hall for National Earthquake Early Warning System equipment. And the council adopted bylaw authorizing the mayor and clerk to enter into a lease agreement with Natural Resources Canada. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn, Dan. And Patrick's coming in for this one? Yes. While we're waiting for uh, Patrick, Mr. Mayor, we had earthquakes on Alicia Street thanks to the roller. <laughs> Okay, Patrick. All right. Uh, hello, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you for hearing from me tonight. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the uh, Earthquake Early Warning Detection System. Uh, Kayla, would you mind putting up the... Thank you very much. It's coming up. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is a program... Uh, oh, we still don't have it. Well, I don't still have it. It's just been lagging a little bit, so just give it one second. Okay. Do you see it now? I, I do not know. There we are. There it is. Uh, so this is uh, a program uh, that was instituted in 2019. Uh, it's, the plan is to have it operational in 2024. Uh, so in 2019, Natural Resources Canada was tasked with creating an earthquake early warning system. Uh, the point of the early warning system is to send a uh, a warning to critical infrastructure, so that's critical medical, uh, such as surgical rooms, things like that, uh, transportation, uh, so you can start to slow down trains to theoretically uh, mitigate derailments or stop derailments, uh, and other items as well, of course, and uh, energy production, uh, especially when it comes to nuclear, uh, you can have that much longer to prepare the facility for an incoming earthquake. Uh, this is important to us because Southwest British Columbia and Ottawa and the Ottawa to Quebec City uh, corridor have been identified as the highest risk areas in Canada. Um, and as a result of that, uh, and Kayla, I'll get you over the next slide. As a result of that, uh, Natural Resources Canada is hoping to have a sensor every 20 to 30 kilometers in this region uh, just to capture that data and hopefully get the warnings to the critical infrastructure. Now we are talking about seconds to tens of seconds of uh, information or of, of a warning rather. So that doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, 
in an active surgery or when it comes to a nuclear facility or automatic fail safes, that is significant. Uh, and if we go to the next, so that's all of the earthquakes that have happened uh, in, uh, in recorded history. And of course you see that our region along with uh, the coastal regions is hit the hardest. And next slide. Um, we just get a closer look at the Ottawa to Quebec City <coughs> corridor, which is, uh, and the probability, uh, we are at the edge of the highest probability of seismic activity, uh, but it's definitely, we're definitely still in that orange. Um, and this is kind of an idea of how it works. So the cones represent sensors and they're spaced roughly 20 to 30 kilometers apart uh, in our area. And once two or three of them uh, become tripped by the early waves, the, the idea is the first wave of the seismic activity, the vibrations are smaller, but these uh, units will detect them and send it to the earthquake alert center, which then send it out to the critical infrastructure to get that seconds to tens of seconds, um, which again is significant to those, uh, to that type of infrastructure. Uh, so, we're talking about this today because in June of 2021, uh, the town was approached by Natural Resources Canada to house one of the sensors in the uh, fire hall that we have in town. Uh, we've got a number of locations that are suitable, but uh, their technician is going to come out in the event that we agree to have them. Uh, they need one square meter of floor space. Uh, there's no cost to the town for any installation or maintenance. Uh, we would pay minor utilities, and that is, I've been told, roughly the equivalent of leaving one light on. Uh, so not, not a huge amount. With this, that, uh, the previous slide, that's what the unit looks like. Uh, it's just a small sensor. It's a, a, a large enough unit that goes on the wall, and a small <coughs> sensor goes to the floor. Uh, and with this, they're fairly durable. They do mount them outside. Uh, and in the event, even if it's in the fire hall garage and it gets sprayed with a hose, it's not a big deal. Uh, they are fairly durable from what I've been told. And Natural Resources Canada has proposed a 10-year lease with no rental fees uh, to be part of this network. They would only have access to the facility uh, when arranged with the town prior, uh, prior to their showing up. And, and we did send this lease through our insurer as well as Fueled Networks, our IT contractor, just to ensure there was nothing missed. Um, and they advised that the, follow that the following amendments were spelled out in the contract, which we have now added. Natural Resources Canada has agreed to these uh, should we enter into the agreement. Uh, and with this, the town is absolved of all liability in all cases. So fire, flood, we hit it with a hammer, we pay no bills. Um, the installers will be pre-qualified uh, if they're working on our network, if they're working on our buildings, our electrical system, anything. Uh, maintenance, maintenance costs and activities are solely by Natural Resources Canada. Uh, we take no responsibility for any of that. And costs for any IT modifications, uh, including to partition our firewall, uh, which fueled network uh, estimated around a half day of labor would be again paid by Natural Resources Canada and all electrician costs for providing a dedicated outlet would again be covered by them. So we would see no difference to our operational use of the facility. Uh, right now we're hoping we can put the unit just under the stairs of the hose tower. Um, and if as long as that works for them, that's where we're going. Otherwise it'll be just in a corner of the garage. Uh, fire staff has been involved in the discussion, of course, because they have to deal with it every day. And uh, they will be, they will, of course, have a large say in where it goes in the end, as long as we can find somewhere between the technicians and uh, fire staff that's agreeable. And this would also be tied into the American network as well. So it would be a North American wide network that we would be contributing to. Uh, the big, we wouldn't benefit a great deal from it. We would just be uh, kind of contributing to the Canadian, to a Canadian system. Thank you. So if you have any questions at all, I'd be happy to uh, elaborate. Okay, thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> any questions from anyone? Dan? Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, does this system have to be in a secure area? Uh, not necessarily. They prefer in populated areas to have it in a secure area. 
area uh, just to prevent vandalism. Uh, typically, they're only outside, uh, like when they're in the mountains in BC and things like that. So my concern was if there was a technical issue and it's in the fire hall, they'd have to have a fireman come to open up the door in order to get to have access. And if there was, like, because they are every 20 to 30 kilometers, if it failed in the middle of the night, it doesn't matter a great deal. Uh, they would schedule a technician uh, during the day on our schedule. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, all in favor then, please. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> Is there a debt management policy? Council authorize a bylaw adopting a debt management policy. Mover and seconder, please. Lisa, Lynn, and Jennifer. Thank you, Mayor Stack. Uh, Mayor Stack, members of council, I just wanted to talk about um, the proposed debt management policy that's on council this evening. So the legislation that does set out for annual debt and financial obligation limits for municipalities um, that legislation is OREG 40302. Um, we do get uh, from the ministry annually um, what's called our annual uh, debt limitation. We refer to it as the annual repayment or the, you might have heard it called the ARL. And that all stems from that OREG and that legislation. Um, and we all know that municipalities, we have limited resources. Um, so often debt is a financial tool that is utilized by most, most municipalities as part of their funding structure. So really having a debt management policy and developing those guidelines for debt issuance, it really is a best practice. Uh, it establishes good governance um, for the responsible management of municipal financial resources, and it ensures that these annual debt limitations are adhered to. So the proposed debt management policy that's um, um, included on the council agenda tonight, uh, it does support the town's pay-as-you-go financial model. Um, it helps provide overall debt management guidelines uh, financial management requirements and some debt limitations. And, you know, really in order to be an effective financial tool, you know, the provisions of debt management policies, they have to be compatible with the municipality's goals pertaining to your capital plans, your reserve and reserve funds and your operating budget, uh, which this policy does. So, and with a debt management policy, it, you really are looking for the strike that appropriate balance between establishing limits on your debt um, and yet still providing that sufficient flexibility so that municipality can respond to unforeseen circumstances or new opportunities. Um, so uh, this evening, so the report and the policy, it, they both support the town of our prior strategic vision to have a sustainable financial model uh, with a sound financial um, and fiscal responsibility and accountabilities and to manage debt effectively. Um, so um, I'm open to any questions the council has on the policy and we also have included the bylaw um, tonight as well to adopt the policy on council's agenda for consideration. Thanks. Okay, questions, comments, anyone? Another easy one, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, all in favor then, please. <clears throat> Dan and Chris, <clears throat> Lynn, okay, that's three I got. Okay, sorry, four, Carrie, thanks. Sorry about my throat, but I was trying to count the hands here. I only saw three. <clears throat> okay, committee reports, we have uh, corporate services. Have minutes. Does the council receive the following committee minutes as information? Corporate services advisory committee of September 7th, 2021. Move and second, <clears throat> sorry. Lisa and Lynn, any questions on in the report? All in favor then, please. Thank you, Carrie. We have no notice of motion. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, may I may I add something to this category? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, just uh, the CAO had asked me to bring up that I, last meeting last week spoke about the flag raising, and I know that that's on a lot of people's minds. And um, we had talked about raising the flag as the city has for um, just before Remembrance Day to lower it again for Remembrance Day in order to reflect it and, and memorialize our veterans as well. So uh, the committee was in favor of that to raise it for a day or two so that we can then lower it on Thursday um, and then keep it lowered until a further permanent memorial can be decided upon. So I just was throwing that out um, for council's consideration tonight so that we can 
seeing as uh, Remembrance Day is this Thursday. That's a good idea. Okay, so they would raise it, Thursday is Remembrance Day, so we would raise it Wednesday, lower Thursday? Either that, either raise it tomorrow or Wednesday. Or tomorrow. It is noticeably up so that when it's lowered, it, it's it's uh, our memorial for um, our veterans and, and then keep it lower then as a continual um, memorial or um, reflection on the lives that were lost at the residential schools until a permanent uh, memorial fixture can be decided upon. So maybe putting it up a little earlier is a good idea. Yeah. Lisa, yes. I'm just wondering, um, I think I definitely would support that from a rules of procedure point of view, do we need to suspend anything to move something forward for a motion or? Sorry, um, for the, oh. sorry, <laughs> Maureen, go ahead. Uh, sorry, um, for the uh, flag to be uh, raised, no, simply because we didn't pass a resolution um, saying that would be down indefinitely. That was a consensus of council, but no, we would just by, by merit of consensus again. Yeah. Okay. Did I see another hand? No. Okay. So then I'm going to, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I no, just, I just, I was going to ask for a consensus. That's right. yeah. Just, we listened to uh, the prime minister and how the federal government's doing it. And I thought we'd just mirror what they do. Which is? What, what Lynn has said. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so now I'm looking for just a acknowledgement here from all members of council that there's a consensus, Chris and Lisa, Lynn, myself, and certainly if you want and, to pass a motion yeah. on that, we certainly can. If it makes it clear in everyone's mind, um, that would be fine as well, Mayor. Well, we certainly have a consensus. I didn't see your hand, Ted, was the only one I didn't see. You, Yeah, I'm so everybody's in agreement. I'm confused at what we were doing. I'm still a little bit confused. We're going to lower the flag tomorrow, raise the flag tomorrow, lower it again for Remembrance Day in honor of our veterans. And then it would stay lowered after that. Stay lowered. Yeah. Indefinitely. That's the, uh, the position council had taken before, and that's the recommendation of committee, Lynn? Yes, and it would just, it would be lowered, um, Councillor Strike, until IDAC um, comes back to council for some further considerations for a permanent, more, uh, a, a more permanent um, scenario for it to memorialize uh, the, the children that were lost in residential schools. So we need to have a more permanent recognition of that separate from the flag. Right. Yeah. Do we have any idea what length of time it's uh, going to take for something in that we're in uh, November? I would imagine because there was a, a, an idea kicked around, um, but a, um, the decision was made to go to the Algonquin um, and ask for their input or approval, if you want to say, just to, to make sure that we are considering all people um, uh, invested in this. So I, Ted, do not have a timeline, um, but I do believe that considering they are looking for more on uh, on um, Mark Graves this week, that we should, as a nation, absolutely be um, showing this, uh, this small way of support until we can do something more permanent. Well, first of all, the federal, go government, ahead, the federal government is not going to uh, leave the flag lowered. They're going back up. And I guess my concern is I, I'm not comfortable with them being half masked for the whole winter. That's why I was asking for some sort of an idea. Is it going to be uh, well, I know you don't have it, Lynn, because it was not enough time to even talk about something, but right. uh, I would support it if, in fact, it's going to be worked on until it's finished. So, um, uh, something, Lynn, this committee then asked staff or somebody to contact uh, the Algonquins. Yes. That's in the process. Has that been done, clerk or CEO? I don't What's the timeline of yes, doing that? It, it was asked. It hasn't been done yet. No. Okay. So 
that would go out in the next week or so we're saying is that yes yes so if that goes out in the next week so then we're kind of you know uh, waiting on them to respond i guess is going to be sort of the unknown on that but i would think certainly by your next meeting we should we should have a response so let's remember that IDAC has decided to meet on a monthly basis due to the amount of things that um, are on the horizon that they want to deal with. So um, to think that they will get response within that time frame might be pushing it, um, considering that I would imagine the um, Algonquins have been getting inundated with other suggestions and ideas as well that they probably are being pulled in many different um, directions. Yeah, it's reasonable. Dan, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On the, on the county side of the house, th there's a reconciliation garden being uh, prepared or made, created in, in the front of the International Drive in front of the flags and that um, Chief Jocko has uh, been in favor of this and they've got the the person from the lodge, the turtle lodge coming to uh, have a competition on the creation of this thing, what it's gonna look like. And that'll be the Andrew County recognition for the children. Nice. Thank you. So would it, uh, after meeting the chief and McNabb a couple months ago, maybe we could send this out in the next week, wait a week or so, and maybe then I could make a phone call to her and ask, you know, for some feedback, you know, just to give, you know, kind of, I don't think we'll see any resistance in it at all, but. No, no and, and I certainly think it's appropriate to uh, Mayor Stack for you as, as the elected head of the municipality to be approaching uh, Chief Jocko and yeah. the Turtle um, Lodge. Yeah. That would be, that I would think be. I still have her card and she said, call her anytime on anything, so. You know. Perfect. So then maybe we will have our answer before our next meeting. So the clerk will get in touch with me after she sent the letter and then we'll we'll set a time for it and we'll get right back to you, Lynn. So Thank you so much. We'll try to shorten that time length, Ted. As tight Thank as you. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I said no notice of motions, Dan, was your county report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There was a delegation at the last county meeting for the long-term development of Deep River and District Hospital. Ms. Jana Hodson, President CAO, and David Cox, the chair of the long-term committee, attended the meeting to advise council of the progress they have made in creating a new long-term facility, which uh, houses 96 beds and they're married after the, the grove. The delegation, Ms. Lacey Rose, our county forester, reported on the health of our trees, which is rated as fair. The gypsy moth has infested 13,000 hectares in the county and 146,000 in the province. Lazy has recommended to the province that the black ash not be on the endangered species. The most underrated infestation is the beech bark, which is brought into the forestry by the general public when they visit the different campsites from Ottawa or wherever they're coming from. The county has contracted the Perry Group Consulting Limited to complete an information technology digital strategy for the county and will be meeting with municipal elected officials for their input. Don't know when that's going to happen. County has passed a vaccination policy similar to ours. There will be an amendment that deals with the penalty if a county councillor does not meet the requirements. That's forthcoming. The Ontario Winter Games were voted in as a go at the last county. There was a, a motion to cancel and it didn't, didn't work. The United Way bestowed the top honor, the Community Builder of the Year Award to the region's medical officers of health and the respective healthcare practices during COVID-19. Dr. Robert Cushman, a friend from County, Dr. Vera Etches from Ottawa Health, Paul Rukinitis, and the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, Dr. Paula Stewart, from Leeds Granville and the Lanark District Health Unit. EORN, the Eastern Ontario Regional Network is having some setbacks, a new director to be elected and the current CAO has resigned. As well, there is a new federal minister of rural economic development, the Honorable Goody Hutchins. 
The Roma 2022 Rural Opportunities Conference will be run Sunday, January 23rd, uh, Tuesday to January 25th. The main conference will be held on Monday and Tuesday, but there could be zone meetings and other activities on Sunday. Early registration fee before 01 November, which has passed, is $400 and now it's $450. Of note uh, that uh, Eli Shalotantri is now the first vice chair, Zone 8 and Councillor for City of Ottawa. The County of Council, County Council has paid my way to go to this thing, so we will be attending in virtually. Um, the Roma sponsored Teeny Tiny Summits are back with three dates, correction, two dates. They're free virtuals on December the 1st and March 22nd. If I remember right, uh, Lynn was part of this tiny thing that went for the business people. Presenters include Tarak Haddad, piece of chocolate, the resurgence of teeny tiny communities with Peter Kenyon, Bank of Ideas, Roma Chair Robin Williams. Opportunities for rural Ontario in the post COVID world. Of note, the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, the ICP, comes with a clause that Indigenous groups must be consulted. In the case of the Algonquin Trail ICIP grant, the cost of this consultation with the Pekawakanon of Golden Lake is $19,624.63, roughly 20% of the grant. Great news for the Algonquin Trail users. On 19 October, the city of Pembroke approved motorized usage of the Algonquin Trail within the city limits. Housing market stats, uh, you know, we're all owners of houses. Stats from 2020, we had 26. 2021, there was 23. And the value continues to climb. 2020 was 404,638. 2021 is 526,963. Of note, to date, the county has 719 building permits compared to 391 last year. CNL is having a virtual open house from 15 to 30 November on a small modular rea reactor made by Global First Power. There is a town hall meeting at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, 16 November. You can participate by calling 1-877-299-849. We put this through to Marine to go on our website if you want to look at this thing in a little bit more detail. This uh, little, not history, but the small modular reactor is the first one in history, and it's their uh, a showcase, and CNL is putting it on. Today was the last day for operations and development property committees, meaning for the year. Uh, the new committees will be formed uh, at County Council in December. And that's it for the county. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thanks. Interesting enough, I remember back when I was on the uh, AECL committee for the county, just at uh, the early stages of developing the small nuclear reactor, one of their hopes for them are particularly the northern communities where they can get rid of some huge diesel generators and things like that so, because they're much more environmentally friendly and they can produce cheaper power for them. You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> okay, uh, correspondence, Kayla, please. The correspondence package I-21, November 19, be received as information and filed accordingly. Mover and seconder, please. Dan and Chris, comments? Lynn. There is a um, request, I'm gonna call it, on page 77 to 79 from CPAN. Uh, Lynn Smith, the director of CPAN, um, I was chatting with her last week on a couple of other issues and um, she told me that this was coming in. And so I, uh, I wanted to bring it forth, um, in hopes that my peers here will, um, uh, what's the word I'm like support moving it into the action plan and actually supporting this. Uh, it is their festival of trees. Um, I know that we were all shocked a few years back to find out the percentage of our children in Empire that actually live uh, in the poverty line or under. And we then had created um, our um, advisory committee, which both Councillor Toner and I sat on and came up with many different um, action items on that. And so you know that's moved on and, and they're working on those action items as a, as a, a, a community group. 
but we as council, I don't think can turn our back on, on the whole um, need. So Festival of Trees is, it always happens up in Pembroke. And as Lynn was telling me, a lot of the sponsors in it, like the county supports it and Pembroke supports it and whatnot. But CPAN services all of Renfrew County. So they spend, you know, they send thousands of dollars worth of donations and whatnot to children in our community. So I feel as a municipality that we need to sponsor um, this uh, event in, in as part of the recipients of the, you know, of what they do. Um, I know we, you know, in our action uh, items, we have um, uh, rentals that we're going to waive for this club or we do this for that and, and whatnot, but we have to take care of the children. You know, years ago when we formed that committee, we were all appalled at the number of children that are living in poverty. So I hope that the rest of council will support this. There are a number of different items on there and I, I believe that we should be right up there and, and supporting this function. Well, I, I would motion that we actually be the Christmas Tree Avenue um, sponsor, which is $3,000. We do this on an annual basis and that's our gift and our giving because they're giving back to our community. Uh, just one question for clerk first. Does it have to go into action then or can it be a motion now? Or Well, um, I mean, you could do a motion, but I'm, I'm not even sure in our grants uh, what we have available. I'd have to double check even our grant budget, our grant budget line, um, just to confirm that we actually have that kind of money in our, uh, our grant budget line, because that's where it would come out of. That's my understanding. So I'm just, may I miss? Okay. I am passionate about this as I would hope we all should be. And I understand, you know, Maureen, that typically speaking, things like this come out of our, our, our um, grant, but, you know, um, physician recruitment and some of the other things that we do on an annual basis, I'm not sure if those come out of grant or if they become an item line on our um, budget. And I'm going to suggest that if we don't have that money in our grants, we need to find it somewhere else because I do feel that we are socially should, you know, uh, we should be supporting this and, and, and we should be doing it in, in, in a way every year. I don't understand why we haven't been in the past. Okay, could I just give me one second here, Dan, because I'm just trying to want to sort this out. Because I'm sitting here thinking we've done this before and left it up to the treasurer to find the money if we were short somewhere so that we could do it. So we have one option, we could go that route. We could defer this and bring it back next week on an action plan with a firm thing and have the finances sorted out and make the decision on December 8th. There's just two options that are in my mind. We'd have the exact details, you know, to do it. Dan's next. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Exactly to bring it back. When we do our grant policies, uh, the grant uh, recipients usually make a presentation to the council to see exactly where we're going and how this is happening. And with the information we get, then we can have the discussion afterwards and, and do what Lynn is, is doing. But to go on the, the correspondence package, I think we need to have a little bit more material. Thank you. Well, okay then. Yeah. So in all fairness, when Lynn Smith sent this in, it was a request for funds. It was a request. It was put on. It a it was it was missed for one, and, and I I actually asked Kayla um, to please put it in in, and I guess I should have been more um, specific because I really thought it was coming in as the action because I do believe she had a conversation with the mayor and the mayor asked her to send the details to the clerk to be put into the uh, into our correspondence package. So I fully, she fully expected it was coming in as a request from, from the get-go, not just as information. Um, I, I, I understand and, I, and um, everybody's need for more details, but this event 
It's happening on November 20th. She did send this in in October. Um, and again, I th it's not just it, it's not just a you know a, a, a festival or whatever. It is actually their major fundraiser for their funds, which they get no government funding for. They have to raise every penny that they need to support the children of poverty in this in this uh, county. So again, we were all appalled years ago when we found out the number of kids that were in that situation in our backyard. And I think that we need to just find a way to do this and do this before their event happens so that we can be one of their sponsors. This is not like the first year that CPAN has approached us, they have in the past. I got a phone call one day last week uh, when I was away and I did, I think I maybe emailed or texted, I, mean, I just forget, uh, and just said, would we make sure they got onto the, the correspondence for a discussion tonight? And I didn't specify one or the other. I was uh, preoccupied at the time, so I was just sending a quick text or an email on it. But, you know, I, you know, I certainly support the idea of it, but I see it as the same as neighbor link, you know, and it becomes an angel. So I think it is a grant issue, you know, and, and should come under that grant policy. And that, you know, and if, if that policy doesn't have enough money in it this year, as we've done in other years, we've increased it come budget time. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any problem with the particular amount. I think that's very similar to what we do at neighbor link. Uh, and it's just another way, but it's more, this is focused on kids only. NeighborLink is focused on the community in general. So, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I don't want to, I'm not sure just, I don't want to uh, drive the, the line item into a negative, I guess, is what I'm trying to avoid. So that's the only question I have. And I'm sure that uh, CPAN will be happy in December to take our check as they will be now, but I would just, I'd like, I would prefer it stay in the grant caliber of things and come back with the finances. And then we can direct people to make the donation if that's the wish of council and we can look to the treasurer to fund it. You know, uh, like that hidden account she has in her office there somewhere <laughs> that she can, she can search out, you know? And I would, I, that's my thoughts on it. A consensus for people. So then we'll bring it back to the December 8th meeting as an action item. We'll know exactly what the numbers are and we'll deal with it as a motion uh, in the action item on December 8th. And then we can re respond to her right away the next day. You know? Okay, folks? Yep. <clears throat> Dan, yeah. Can we continue on with the uh, correspondence, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, I think everybody's finished with that, yeah. So it's uh, on page five of the Ontario government will introduce legis legislation that would, would possibly get the $15 uh, effective 1st of January. Effective uh, 01 November, the Ontario government has mandated that all regulated Ontario electricity and natural gas utilities to provide a green button to the customers within 24 months. This green button will permit users to better manage their facilities and utilities. Good news for Apple users, you can now choose the official QR code to your Apple wallet, which I don't have. As a veteran, I commend the Ontario government for introducing legislation that would amend the Remembrance Day Week Act to permit workers the right to wear poppies at their workplace. Page 30, Ontario extending temporary wage enhancement with the additional 373 million for personal health care workers until 31st of March, 2022. Starting last Friday, persons who are 70 over can now register to get a, a vaccine booster, and that's a, uh, I call it an Alka-Seltzer. It's not a Pfizer. On page 67, AMO has uh, released five fact sheets to help municipalities navigate the new Conservation Authorities Act. To the CEO, have we reviewed these fact sheets, and could council be briefed on what the impact will be to Arm Park? Sure, um, Councillor. Lynch uh, to the mayor. For the mayor, we have uh, reviewed, and the simple answer is there will be no impact on our person since we are not 
uh, part or within the jurisdiction of any conservation authority. So we don't believe that this will have any impact on the town. Thank you. On page 72 is uh, previously reported 2022, the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund for Arm Fire is $1,588,880, which equates to $369 per household. And again, that's thanks to our, our treasury people, um, Jennifer and her team for doing the FIR on time. And lastly, Mr. Mayor, bad news. If you're a natural gas provider, Enridge will be advised on 01 April 22, they have applied for an increase to their rates to recover costs associated with greenhouse gas. Thank you. Another one. Chris. Chris, you had your hand up? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, number one E. Ontario are helping more people with development disabilities access housing. Uh, there's, there'll be 13 million additional uh, dollars invested to help people with development disabilities and their families or caregivers navigate housing options in the community. And also uh, the money will help expand programs to support more independent living. So. Some good, uh, some a little bit of money going to some really good, really good uh, people. Also, uh, one eye Ontario is supporting Indigenous-focused mental health, addictions, and trauma support with over thirty-six million dollars in funding to support the mental health and well-being of Indigenous peoples and communities across the province. Also, annualized funding of more than $16 million is also being devoted to cross-government investments in Indigenous services to support the implementation of the Roadmap to Wellness, a plan to build Ontario's mental health and addiction systems. So again, uh, some money going towards uh, people who desperately need it. So well done. Thank you. Anybody else? All in favor then, please. Okay, carried. And the next one, Kayla, please. That the correspondence package number A21, November 11, be received and that the recommendations outlined be brought forward for council consideration. Mover and seconder again. Dan, Lynn, comments? Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the general manager of finance. It's the number two, it's a QP request for independent audit of the OMARS. I'm curious uh, who will pay for this audit? Will the audit identify only arm prior? And as I understand it, other municipalities have been asked for the same audit. Could we throw some light on this, please? Um, I took a thorough read of those documents and it's my understanding from going through it that QP is suggesting um, that the OMERS fund itself uh, fund this additional review. Uh, it's my understanding that they're not, they're just looking for municipalities to support the process um, that the audit occur and the additional review happen um, and not to ask for any funding from municipalities uh, to support the process. Okay, uh, I was chatting with Robin about it this morning and I read stuff over the weekend uh, a third party review on any situation like that, I think is a, is a good thing to keep in mind that there are contributors to the OMERS that are unionized and non-unionized. So my concerns was as well that I thought that, uh, you know, the, the, it should be paid for by the union through dues if it was their request, but if they uh, think they can get OMERS to pay for it, I guess that's uh, going to be up to them. Pretty significant poor performance if you look at the last couple of years. So I'm not so sure that the review isn't such a bad idea, but it's truly third party and independent. Okay, <clears throat> any other comments? Stay okay. all in favor of that report then? Carried, thank you. So we have four bylaws. We need to pull any of them out. No, okay, Kayla, we'll take all four of them. That the following bylaws be and are hereby enacted and passed. Bylaw 722621, Parlock Control Marshalls Bay Meadows. 722721, appoint a deputy fire chief. 
7228-21 lease agreement with Natural Resources Canada, seismic detection equipment, 7229-21 adopt debt management policy. Move and seconder, please. Lynn and Lisa, any further comments on any of them? All in favor then, please. Carried, thank you. So announcements, and I'm gonna to start tonight because I have a few, I think my list might be longer than Dan's even, but I'll, uh, first of all, just publicly to again, uh, congratulate uh, Corey Nicholas on uh, promotion and acceptance of the role as their deputy chief in our fire department. I think there's a good solid team of leadership over there now and uh, we look for good things. The other thing is uh, over the weekend, you probably read that Henry Omo, who was the owner of a &O Auto Parts, for uh, years, 54 years actually, a strong business man in our empire and a great community contributor passed away. So I did uh, submit condolences on behalf of council and the residents of our empire. Uh, the our empire skateboard club had a fundraiser at our rink of dreams uh, on November, uh, October 30th with costumes and all for a Halloween theme to it. Uh, there was a new piece of equipment on display that was uh, understood voluntarily built and it was a real successful fundraiser. So good to them and thanks for their effort. Another thing I uh, want to acknowledge is uh, probably read the article on Bill Grease's retirement from coaching the Packers and hockey and Empire for the past 25 years. Bill's uh, a, a great corporate citizen too and has been in business in Empire for years. And he's uh, getting off the skates and giving up the shouting, I guess. So uh, my uh, appreciation out to Bill. And uh, the clerk did do a certificate and I'll drop by his business and present it to him on behalf of council. Okay, anyone else then? Dan, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Only one is, uh, well, actually three. One is uh, Remembrance Day is uh, obviously Thursday. The Reefs will be in place at the Cenotaph. There's nobody escorting the reef up and they'll be doing the regimental silence, all that good stuff. And we've uh, been told that uh, 450 squadron, that's the big uh, Chinook helicopter, will do a fly past at 1111. So that should make the people in the hospital uh, tune up a bit. And I'm not going to mention monies for the Armpire Hospital chase the ace or the lions because I haven't won. So I'm going to change my strategy and say nothing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, we have no media questions, no closed sessions. Confirmatory bylaw. Bylaw 723021 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the regular medium council held on November 8th, 2021, B, and is hereby enacted and passed. Mover and seconder, please. Lynn and Ted, all in favor? Carry, thank you. Adjournments. Lisa and Lynn, all in favor? Oh, Carry, thank you. Hey, thanks a lot.